pathway to become a professor in the United States. Today, we're here with Professor Jackie Eastman. Hello, Jackie. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Let's start with a question of what are some of the pathway to become a professor in the U.S., such as teaching, research, leadership, and service? Okay, sure. I think some of my tips in terms of the pathway is that as a faculty member, you want to be very consistent and you want to be able to demonstrate excellence in each of those areas. I think also some of the pathways is to work with your department chair, work with your senior faculty, work with the promotion committee, so that you're very clear on what the expectations are going in. Hmm. And so that the work you're doing is leading you onto that pathway in terms of teaching, research, service, and leadership. Um, as faculty members, it's really easy to get pulled into a hundred different directions and people are saying, you know, do this, do that. And you need to really be strategic. And this is where working with your chair can be very helpful in terms of what are the must do activities with teaching and demonstrating that you're becoming a better teacher, you're staying up to date on the material, that it's interactive and engaging and preparing the students. Um, what are you doing in terms of your research that's impactful? What are you doing with your service, both internally within the you know, mm. department, college, university, as well as externally to the academic community and your community around you? And then leadership, how you are progressing into becoming an academic leader. And so I think working with your chair will be very helpful to guide you as what are the must do activities and what are the other activities that are nice to do as you have time? Yes, I think that is a very good suggestion. And in fact, I must say from my own experience, what you have mentioned is is, is really important, especially work with the people who are uh, the chairperson, the head of department, the person who are more senior, so we can see the clear pathway of the expectation of what we should do. But I like the tips that you mentioned about being consistent because I noticed there were a few cases who worked who, who who did very well excellent before the PhD or, or once they finished the PhD but not throughout the next few years so some people might have like you know five papers five strong papers in the first one years and after that is nothing for many years it's then it's very hard to 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 negotiate and argue about that case of consistency in terms of performance so we have to be very careful with that now, Jackie, you did touch briefly about impact of research. What do you mean by impact of research? Well, I think there's um, lots of different ways of looking at impact. You know, the, the first one that comes to mind is the impact factor of the journals you publish in. But you can also look at impact who's citing your work. Um, you can also look at impact in terms of is your work having an influence on the field. So in the real world, in practice, is it being discussed? Are you establishing yourself as a thought leader so that other universities want to hear from you on this research area? And so I think that there's multiple ways of demonstrating impact. Hmm. So you could have someone that you have a very niche area, so you might hit journals that don't have a huge impact factor, but practitioners are using your research. And so to me, that's still very impactful research. Or you could have an article in uh, you know, a B journal, but have it be cited consistently year after year after year. And so I think there's a lot of different ways to demonstrate impact. Yes, yes. That is a very good example given by you. Thank you so much for that. Now, let's explore more in terms of the academic job promotion. Uh, I know that you have mentioned a few 
pathway, let's touch about some tips for successful job promotions. Do you have any specific tips that you can give to the audience? I think a specific tip would be keep good records. And and part of it is because you think, oh, I'll, I, I'll remember everything I did. There's so many things that we do. So what I would recommend is, and I'm old school, so I like a paper copy of everything too. And some schools have the old, you do a binder. Some schools, it's all electronic. But as you do things, set up a folder. And so you might have a folder for, you know, set up a promotion tenure folder in your compute, computer. And so you keep adding things. So it's not that, gee, a month before it's due, yeah. you're trying to find your own articles or you're, you know, when you go to different events, because part of what a committee is going to be looking at, because something to keep in mind is that a lot of the people that are going to make the decision and review your packet are not people in your field, that they might be in other business disciplines, or as you move up, you know, might be, you know, other leaders in the university that may not be business um, academics. And so, the burden on the faculty is to demonstrate. So let's say, for example, with teaching, that if you did something, um, it didn't work as well as you would have liked, so you made changes, and those changes had more of an impact, you need to demonstrate that. So it might be, okay, here's what happened, here's how I fixed it, here's examples of the improvements. So... It could be something as simple as here in my online course, let me show you the table of contents for my modules before and after. So you see the additional materials or here's a project, how I revised the project. And here's an example of a, a well done project that demonstrates that the students are learning and being able to take what they've gotten from your course and apply it into the real world. So I think you wanna start keeping those examples as you go along because it's a lot more time consuming later to start putting these all together. Mm, yeah. So, and, and it might just be even as simple and this sounds silly, but I have a plastic bin and whenever I have something I think I might want to mention this later. I just throw it in the bin and then I go through the bin every year. Okay, what was something that I need to, you know, include as documentation or I'll go, I can't even remember I did that. And so I think just the need for good records. And as so many universities are going more to an electronic um, promotion portfolio, I think you know, scanning those documents, putting them in a folder ahead of time. It's a lot easier if you've got them in one folder and then you organize it. Then if you're trying to search all your, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, but I do the, you know, my files, I have a gazillion files that if you could at least limit to, okay, there's a bunch of things in one file. Mm. Um, that makes it easier. Such an amazing um, suggestion for this first part because anyone who is going to go for job promotion, internal, externally, apply for awards, sometimes grants, you might relate it yourself to this because just an example of think back about record of teaching. Sometimes we will, we will be like, okay, what have I done? I can't remember those. But what Jackie have mentioned that I really like is apart from doing the record, not just the listing, but demonstrate what have you changed, what have you introduced. Those are some of the things that the selection panel looking for, not just the list, but the demonstrations and all that. So I think that is very good. And like what you say, because academics, so many things, research, teaching, service and all that, we, we forget if we not keep the record. Like myself, we also, you know, I always keep the record in a digital format, but I do a backup in a multiple multiple places otherwise we crash and i hope jackie after today this part here will be in your bin as well so <laughs> i mean our conversation today here now um 
Do you have any other, other tips that you would like to give? Um, I think the one thing, and this is sort of going back to that consistency, is as you strategically think about what you're doing, you want to avoid those gaps. Because where there's gaps, that's where people start developing questions. And so sometimes you'll see somebody, they'll start off strong. As you mentioned, they'll have that you know, period of what happened. And then right before they go up, they start, you know, they've got a lot of stuff out. Because then the committee will wonder, does this mean that once they get promoted, we're going to have another gap? Hmm. And so I think you want to avoid those gaps. And now sometimes the gaps will occur just because of, the review process. So part of it is as you're developing your narrative, you know, you want to talk about, okay, that I did these conference pieces this year, and then I developed them into journal articles the next year. So they can see the progression. And so I think, you know, it's important to think about the narrative in each of these areas and sort of to explain why yeah. um, you're doing these things. And I think knowing up front, here's the guidelines and work towards those guidelines and your plan should be to exceed the guidelines. Um, you don't want to be that person that your department chair, your faculty member on the committee, your dean is having to fight for you. Mm -hmm. You want to make it that, you know, everyone sees your pack and goes, Oh, of course, this is this is an easy decision. You want to make it as easy as possible for the people in making your case. Yes, yes. I think that is a very good suggestion in terms of aim to exceed the expectation. So um, like what you say is a is a clear green, green light that you can go ahead. Can I explore more in terms of you saying the word gap, the periods of the gaps? When you say gap here, Uh, one year, I maybe is still acceptable, but probably from more than one year, it is not. Is is this the case? Yeah, that's what I'm. I'm thinking particularly when you start getting into the three or more year gap. Mm -hmm. I think that's when people start to get more nervous. Yes, and I think, and now we know that to hit a higher level journal, it's going to take a lot of time. But I think you also need to have other works in the pipeline. And I think that's where you need to have multiple articles in progress. Yes. And, and you can't think linear in a linear fashion of, I'm going to do this piece that once it gets accepted, that I'll start my next project. You've got to have multiple things going on at any one point in time. So while something's under review, You're working on the next piece or, you know, you know, have multiple teams of authors that you're working with. So you can demonstrate that you're not just relying on, you know, one team that you've developed multiple teams as and you'll want to have some things where there's you know fewer authors on. Um, so you can make the case that you know, this is my contribution. Mm. And so I think that's so important. And those type of things will reduce the likelihood of you having these gaps. That is a very good suggestion, especially there there might be some people who might just say want to submit to the top one, top two, top three journals. If they want to do that, probably they could. But at the same time, they might have another team that work on a lower, I mean, still, still strong journal, but not as good. Yeah. So it's, you know, can fill the gaps and all that. Like myself, I just submit one, paper to gems not too long ago and it took almost two years just to prepare it so if i just keep doing this all the time then i won't have anything else you know i've been in you know two or three years so i think it's a very good suggestion to have a strategic you know move of okay what we want to do in this year and what we might want to do in a feeling feeling years and, and but obviously the filler uh topic should be meaningful as well So, so it will be impactful. Now, if we move back to academic path and career, in the past 10 years or so in the United States, do you see any change in trend of how people get promoted or become a professor? I think the bar has been higher and is getting higher. 
Um, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. At first it was just, it has to be a peer reviewed journal with, you know, such a level of acceptance rate. And then, it, you know, so many schools are now going to that idea of it's got to be a journal either in the ABDC list or some schools are making their own journal list. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing an increase in not so much in terms of you know, the numbers of articles, but we're seeing an increase in the expectation of the article type of journals that you're submitting to. And I think even with teaching, we're seeing higher expectations where, okay, you're gonna need to demonstrate that you close the loop, that your teaching has impact on the students. It has impact. So the people that we're putting out as business professors can do this job. And I think even with service, it's not just, oh, I, I was on this committee. It's like, well, what did you do on the committee? How did you contribute to that committee? Um, so I think there's you know, a higher level of expectation across the board. Yes, yes. That is a very good uh, mention there. Can I please explore a little bit more in terms of the impact of the teaching that you mentioned? What do you mean by that? Well, I think, um, you know, part of the issue is with teaching, you know, we, we go to those teaching evaluations. I think I would call those necessary, but not sufficient. And I think that's where you need to show how else are you going to demonstrate? And so I think that's where you show this is what my students are learning. Here are examples of outputs. Here are examples of my students getting jobs. Here is, you know, work with industry that has helped the students. And so I think including those type of examples, showing how you're updating your materials, because, you know, the fields of marketing, you know, while yes, there's some basics, a lot of it, you know, it's not like we're teaching college algebra where, the form, you know, it stays we the same all the time. Yeah, you you're always having. So I think showing that updating and the students today are different than the students I taught 20 years ago. So your materials need to reflect those needs. It needs to be more of a visual type, you know, yeah. medium as opposed to oh, I have lots of words on my PowerPoint. Now it's. How did you engage them? How did they get it to interact? And you have to recognize we had students that during COVID, you know, were sort of in Zoomville. So now that we're all back, you know, it takes an extra effort to get an interactive, engaging course. So I think you need to demonstrate and talk about what are you doing to create that atmosphere. Yes. Thank you so much for, for the example. So the demonstration is really important. The demonstration is very important to, to anyone. So we should keep that in mind for, for the future purpose of you know, using something in this case. Um, now, when I think about CB or consumer behavior, I will definitely think about yourself and a few other people's, but Jackie's always come up to mind when I think about, okay, who's work around consumer behavior? And you also a co-editor in chief of Journal of Consumer Behavior and, and among other things that you have been doing in, in the MA conference and other things. So to me, I think you are a professor that a lot of people actually respect you. Uh, I would like to ask you like how like how do you or how a person could become a professor that people respect? Well, I think the first thing is just to be authentic. Um and I think as a professor, you should aim to work just as hard, if not harder than you did as a junior faculty. And so I think when your colleagues see that you're still giving it 110%, that you're still active on committees, you're still active in the field, that you're still updating your courses, that you're willing to do a new prep, I think that's the type of thing that is important. 
I think also being a good colleague, being a good, you know, being a good member of the team, you know, being able to jump in and help others. I think those are, you know, be the kind of colleague that you want to have as a colleague. And so I think that idea is also really important. Yes. Thank you. Be a good person. Be someone who would be uh, reliable. And I love that part but where you say work as hard as a junior academic and colleague and also give 100%, you know, 110% of that. And I can see on how you work on your journals, the return time is very quick, the decision time and all that. So there's a lot of commitment for you to work, you know, before hours, after hours, during the weekend and manage other things. So, so Basically, you're also doing something like your love. So you, you love doing this thing. So it's, it's turned out to be very good and well. So I think that is is one of the ways that people, you know, turn to be you know, respect and trust you more and more. Uh, my last question for today is, um, could you please say, let's do like a reflection on, say, a key uh, element that you think you did very well and which lead to where you are today? You know, I thought about that and I tend to be a risk averse person, I guess academic sort of, thing, you know, and, and I'm also an introvert, but when I look at what gave me the biggest payoff as a faculty member in my career is when I took those risks, when I stepped out of my comfort zone, when I said yes, when I thought, oh no, how, is, how am I going to pull this off? And I said, well, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to make it happen. And so I would encourage people that don't be afraid to occasionally take a risk. If it doesn't work out, you can always make a change. Um, but I think when I took those risks in doing something or trying, you know, working with a person I've never worked with before, that that's where I have found my most success and also the biggest joys in my career. Thank you so much, Jackie, for, for, for that uh, demonstration in terms of taking risk. So let's say, um, just for my, for my personal touch, let's say if, if one day I you know, want to become, say, a dean or a head of school or a chairman. So those would consider it as a little bit of risky role for a person who have not done before. What would be your suggestion for those who uh, wanting to or considering to taking this type of role? Well, I think, you know, I think there's sort of a natural progression. First, be um, the head of a committee. Then sort of work towards being a department chair or being like an MBA director or you know, head of graduate programs, and then sort of work up to, you know, assistant or associate dean. I think it's sort of a level of progression. And if that's something someone is interested in, I think, you know, there's a clear path to sort of, you know, almost like a step ladder to get to that point. I think with the dean level, so much of the dean's job is getting very actively involved with AACSB, as well as getting actively involved with donors, because there's such an increasing pressure um, to develop those relationships with alumni and donors. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much for your suggestion, tips, and story, and now where you describe example. I think it's a very good and insightful discussion today. So this is Pathway to Become a Professor in the United States with Professor Jackie Eastman. Thank you so much, Jackie, for your time. Oh, you're welcome.